My company is Utility Compliance Inc. And today we'll be going over the sampling concepts, procedures, and plan applications for water and wastewater operators. Uh, I am recording from my home office and not from a sound studio, so you will get some background noise from time to time. But we'll just keep rolling and uh, it may be two uh, videos if it does have too much background noise. But I'm going to try to do this at once so you guys could have a full concept in one sitting. So the course, well, let's go back and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to follow the presentation. Very informal, so if it's not uh, what you're used to as a full production, then that's okay. We're going to do this informal. It's just like how I teach my students with uh, Florida Gateway College. I'm an adjunct instructor for them. I'm also a wastewater license operator, license in A. Uh, I have a master's in public administration, and my concentration was in environmental policies. I'm also a certified occupational safety specialist. I was a former plant superintendent, compliance and safety officer, a laboratory operator, and a plant superintendent. I'll tell you a little bit about utility compliance. I have two uh, companies. One is Utility Compliance and that provides CEU courses for water, wastewater distribution system. We we'll also do sewer use ordinance development, local limits development, occupational safety services for utilities. Uh, we'll do risk management plans and uh, some utilities need OSHA outreach training and I do that through Utility Compliance. However, I do have a division of utility compliance called OSHA Compliance Help and what that company does is specifically OSHA training and compliance for general industry and construction. Uh, today the entity will be utility compliance uh, providing the sampling course for you. So let's get into it. Why do we sample? So number one why we sample and uh, you're gonna know uh, I'm going to go through some things from the sampling uh, uh, chapters in the uh, Sacramento course and that's the Sacramento course for water and wastewater and that is from the University of California Sacramento uh, Berkeley and that's a great it's almost uh, it's like the wastewater Bible if you will and we'll go through their definitions but then we'll also go through some definitions from the uh, sampling quote unquote Bible, which is the standard method of water and wastewater sampling. So, why do we sample? Uh, the objective of sampling and testing is to demonstrate whether continuous compliance with specific reg regulatory requirements have been achieved. And that's taken from the uh, Sacramento course. Uh, very simply, the objective to sampling is so you could tell what your plant is doing at any given moment. It's a snapshot and in some cases you could uh, get a, a view over a long period of time of what the class is doing. Uh, the Clean Water Act of 1972 came about when there was some growing public awareness about the environment and how the environment was being impacted in air and water pollution and the Clean Water Act specifically was to target uh, how to clean up the American uh, water supplies and that uh, was the catalyst for getting water and wastewater treatment plants funded and some regulatory compliance and that was uh, it gave the basic structure and that basic structure was what the act involved that Clean Water Act. Uh, the only exception for a point source pollution discharge was if there's a permit obtained and a point source discharge is something coming directly from a facility or being discharged right into a water body because that's a direct point to the water system but there's also a non-point uh, source of water that gets uh, excuse me pollution that gets discharged into water and those are usually from cases of runoff, uh, sediments, pesticides that people use for agriculture, uh, maybe some uh, cow manure farms 
uh, or uh, any kind of cattle ranch that has some rain and that rain rushes into a water stream, that's a non-point source of solution because the point of pollution was on the field, but then after a rain event, it carried the pollution over to the water stream. So that's where you get your non-point uh, sources of pollution. This picture here on the slide illustrates different types of pollution you could see. Uh, I'm going to move my mouse and you'll see some nutrients on this side coming from a farm and nutrient pollution right now is a big topic because once nutrients get into the waterways it could create algae blooms, it could deplete oxygen uh, and it also will deteriorate the quality of the water so there's uh, new nutrient standards going around throughout the country uh, for they call it a numeric nutrient criteria standard and that means that the nutrients will have a specific very low uh, criteria for discharge and uh, it varies from state to state so I can't even give you an, an example you'll have to check your state rule but the numeric nutrient criteria is something you should look up and uh, it would be effective uh, for all states. Again, uh, going into why sampling, one of the things that you get uh, from a point source uh, discharge is a national pollution, pollutant discharge elimination system permit. That's an NPDES permit. This uh, slide was specifically for Florida when I first uh, created it. So you'll see Florida Department of Environmental Protection standards. You could substitute that with your state standards, but those are another reasons why you have to sample to make sure that you're meeting those permits and those uh, criteria before the water is discharged to its final destination and there's other regulatory agencies that are involved in making sure that the water does not, the water quality doesn't go down and the pollution doesn't uh, doesn't get worse in your local area. Now there's a book called The Standard Methods of Sampling for Water and Wastewater. Uh, it's a very huge book. It was created in the 1800s uh, first not the book, but there was a movement first in the 1800s uh, for some sort of uniformed, efficient way of analyzing water. And the chemical section of American Association for Advancement of Science, that's C-S-A-A-A-S, uh, they came up with a paper. And the paper first had five topics. They wanted to uh, review sampling criteria for free and amyloid ammonia. Uh, then second, they're only look over oxygen consuming capacities. They had a report on total nitrogen as nitrates and nitrites. Number four was nitrogen as nitrites. And then they had a results at the end. And after all the results, uh, that's what made up this paper back in 1889. And from that paper, uh, branch the standard method book and that standard method book now is used throughout the world uh, but it's from uh, uh, excuse me, 1895 the American Public Health Association APHA and that APHA was the group that first branched out and, uh, and added some methods for analysis of water and wastewater Right now, the current edition as of 2012 is this one right here, and that's the 22nd edition. You can see the size of this thing, so it's very, very detail-oriented, this type of uh, training. And you could just flip through the index, and you could see uh, all kinds of samples that you would need. Uh, if you were trying to even do uh, microbiology, they have pictures in here. They'll show you what the spe uh, species should look like. And it's great because it's color coordinated as well. Uh, so it's a very uh, useful book. If your facility doesn't have one, 
that you grab on. They do have an online version, but I like flipping through the pages. I like having a book, so that's a personal personal preference. Uh, throughout the presentation, you'll see the SM, and that's going to be your standard methods. In 1905. Uh, that's when that book actually uh, became uh, out and it came out through the collaboration of several different organizations. The American Public Health Association was one, the American Water Works Association, uh, the Water the Environmental Federation, and they are all still operating. So you'll see those names uh, throughout your career as a water and wastewater operators. The other manuals that they use for sampling is uh, if you look to uh, your right on the slide, that's a picture of that California uh, Volume 2 book. And that's from the, universe, the California State University, Sacramento. And then there's also a Spellman Standard Handbook for water and wastewater operators. Uh, these are the two links to some other uh, resources for sampling and the bottom link is the Department of Florida uh, DEP and they have a full lab standard operating procedure SOP uh, many states have the same type of documents so look into your state and see if you could get an SOP in your state for this type of training uh, Google is a search the engine that so many people are aware of and the stock is now going crazy. I wish I bought Google stock when it first came out, but I didn't. So I am teaching you this class right now instead of being on my yacht in some sort of uh, Caribbean country. But Google is a fountain of information. You just have to know how to disseminate it. Uh, but I would still start with your standard method book, the actual book for any of your sampling that you want to do. All right, let's go over some sampling and calibration terms because you have to learn the terms that you're going to be using in your classes and your uh, utilities, however uh, you're getting this information, if it's training for a class or training for your utility. Uh, calibration, that's a measurement to test and adjust the accuracy of the measuring instrument or process. So you'll calibrate an instrument uh, just to make sure that that instrument is operating correctly and it's going to give you the right information or else your sampling is worthless. So you have to calibrate your instrument before you use it. A uh, blank. A blank is a bottle containing uh, diluted, uh, excuse me, uh, dilution water or distilled water that does not include the sample that is to be tested. And so that's your, your blank and it's for comparison purposes. So most of these meters, and we'll go into uh, what these meters do, but you need one reference sample cell versus the sample cell that has the sample and the reagent and the, uh, basically the machine will re give you a, a reference one cell to the next so you know uh, there's a reaction in the sample and that uh, amount of reaction tells you what that sample uh, concentration is. So we'll go over that as well. Moving on, the zero sample is different from the blank sample because the zero sample now is a portion of what you're using uh, your, of your sample. So now that zero sample is going into uh, an ampule and you're going to tell the machine this is the natural color of this water or whatever that uh, whatever you're sampling. So this is your natural color, this is your natural state before you add uh, uh, any kind of indicating solution or buffer or reagent. So that's the zero sample. So that's what you're going to put into a, an additional vial. So first you have your blank sample which is going to give you a baseline of your meter then the next is the zero sample where now you're adjusting for whatever that field, uh, the natural field water quality is, that, that color, that TSS of that sample. And yeah, moving on, amper, ampermetric sampling methods. 
And that's a method that uses electric currents flowing to generate uh, rather than uh, your record and you're going to record uh, voltage. So you're, you're using electrical current or generated either uh, through a hand crank or uh, you're plugging the meter in. There's some sort of electric current going through uh, that uh, sampling and then you're going to record your voltage, your uh, meter, and it's going to give you some sort of uh, sample. Uh, it's going to give you a milliamp reading. Uh, colorimetric method, that's where you add uh, a reagent to your sample and the reaction gives you such a color that now you can tell that there is some uh, whatever you're testing for, if it's chlorine and now your sample is bright red then you know that you have a lot of chlorine in your sample as opposed to just a light little tinge of pink where there's hardly any chlorine at all then you, uh, you know that the color is telling you the extreme level of the concentration of whatever that sample is. So, uh, a spectrometer and this is a spectrophotometer. Uh, that's a photoelectric meter used to analyze colometric samples. So instead of using your eyes now to uh, read the intensity of the sample by color, there's a special meter that could now read that. So there's no, uh, there's no uh, variation from one person's eye color to the next, meaning uh, if someone is colorblind, they'll take them a lot longer to figure out if they can what the actual color is of a sample to say it's X milligrams per liter. So now the uh, spectrophotometer, uh, and most people will say that spectrophotometer, uh, will now give you that color reading without any kind of uh, distinction of the person. It will, it will take account of uh, it's, it's a reading that's more concrete as opposed to subjective. That's what I meant to say. Reagent, a substance that takes part in a chemical reaction, and I've touched on this a little in my other definitions, and this chemical reaction, what it's doing is giving you a definite uh, color in order for you to read it. So that substance that's giving you that reaction is your reagent. Uh, a buffer is basically a measure of the capacity of whatever solution uh, it is or liquid to neutralize acids or base. And that's what your buffer is. Endpoint titration, or excuse me, endpoint. Endpoint is when your sample reaches a final reaction stage of a pH and your test is now complete. It's the endpoint pH and that should match up to uh, the blank sample. Uh, your titration is a way of using uh, your chemical strength to drop uh, basically drip by drip into the sample and it's going to give you that uh, end sample pH, that endpoint pH. So you're going to have a uh, chemical, uh, usually it's an acid, a hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid, something, and it's gonna, you're going to drip that into your sample little by little and keep monitoring the pH so as the pH gets to whatever your endpoint pH is and you will know that it has X amount of use of that, um, of that uh, hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid and that will give you a, a range of what your, uh, your sample is. Uh, distillate is another form of, uh, of measuring out uh, a sample. Uh, distillate is the condensed portion of an evaporated sample using a condenser apparatus. So the little picture you see on the bottom of that uh, slide is showing liquid in the bottom and then it's showing uh, little drops of water going out into a beaker uh, in the other side. So what you could 
presume on the bottom is some sort of uh, heat that is boiling that water or that chemical and then steam is rising so after the steam rises it's going to uh, drip out your uh, your condensate and that portion is getting into catching into the beaker and uh, so that's what you're seeing in that picture an aliquot is just a portion of sample that's it here is a meniscus and that one is two different ways of reading a meniscus and the meniscus itself is the curved surface and that's the curved surface of the column of liquid in a container so if you're looking at a container once the liquid uh, goes into the vessel it'll curve either up or it'll curve down when it curves up that means it's water in the container uh, and that's what you're reading however if it curves down then uh, your reading is mercury so you're going to read on a water sample the bottom of the meniscus where if you're reading a mercury uh, you're going to read the top of the meniscus so that very uh, if you're saying it's water that very bottom curved portion in that glass is going to be your reading uh, that's where you want to target your uh, milliliters if you're filling up uh, a glass uh, beaker for milliliters and it's curving down and you want to get to the 10.0 milliliters as opposed to 9.9 .9, you'll have to look at the bottom of that curve and make sure it goes all the way to the 10.0 in order for you to get the right milliliters I'm going to take a drink of water from time to time, so you'll hear me drink in, or you may hear some movement, but I'm going to grab a drink. All right. Basic types of sampling. We've got two basic types of sampling, and then there's some divisions within that. But your first type of sampling is a grab, and simply what that grab is is a snapshot of your system at, one, at any given point uh, in the plant or any given uh, station, sampling station, you're just going to take a nice snapshot of what the plant's doing right now. Now the other type of sampling is called a composite sample. And a composite sample is where you get several different little samples and you don't uh, get the actual reading until a, a given period of time at the end of it. So it's more represented because you're taking uh, several different samples as opposed to one grab, one uh, snapshot. So there's two different types of uh, automatic composite samples, uh, or excuse me, composite samples. One can be uh, through your flow. Let's say you have a certain amount of flow going through the plant and if it's a uh, let's say you want an increment of 10,000 gallons. As soon as you get to 10,000 gallons, you're going to grab a sample physically or you're going to set up an automatic sampler to take a sample at that 10,000 mark. So every 10,000 gallons, a sample is being taken. So that's a flow proportionate sample. Your other sample is time. And so you could actually uh, set your timer to take a sample once every hour let's say or once every half hour or every 10 minutes however you want but that's a timed proportionate sample so there's two differences depending on what you really want in your uh, your final uh, what you what your goal is but you could do it either by flow or you do it by time if you're dealing with a regulatory agency they're going to want to see more flow proportionate sampling as opposed to time uh, because with flow you get an accurate view of what the plant's doing uh, high flows versus low flows you're going to take more samples in high flow as you will uh, as opposed to the samples you'll be taking at low flow but on a 24-hour cycle your composite sample now is going to be more representative 
of what's coming through your plant. Uh, we have some reagents that we use in, uh, in sampling. So these are uh, uh, solutions. Uh, hydrochloric acid is one that you'll use often. Uh, sulfuric acid, that's another one that you'll see often. Uh, nitric acid is used in wastewater treatment and uh, water treatment at times. And ammonium hydroxide. And those are all the chemical uh, uh, compounds in the formulas form. An alkaline solution like sodium hydroxide, NHO4, is used. Uh, the final phenylene, that's an aqueous or alkaloic solution. It's an indicator. It's going to turn the color. Usually it'll turn like a, a purple or green. Uh, methyl purple solution, that's uh, another uh, indicator solution. Once you see that color change, you could add the, uh, the methyl purple in and it doesn't turn purple right away. You'll see a green first. And then later on, as you're adding some uh, solution, it will end up turning purple on you. Uh, your pH, you got a uh, on the top left of the screen. You're going to see that on the slide. Uh, three of the normal types of pHs in wastewater and water: uh, pH 10, 7, and 4. And those are set. That's coming from the manufacturer, and it's telling you that that is the pH for this chemical uh, or for this bottle and the blue is usually uh, 10, yellow is usually uh, 7 pH and pink is usually 4. And so whenever you grab those buffer solutions what you're doing is you're calibrating your pH meter. So now your pH meter uh, you have a known buffer solution and you usually use two points. One is a low and a high uh, and I suggest using uh, your whatever sample it is that you're going to be sampling if it usually has high pH then do the low first low buffer first and then do the high buffer after because it's going to be closer to your sample and it'll give you a better reading uh, after that so do the low and then the high and then after you're finished with your uh, your calibration of your probe then go ahead and do your sample with the high if you're if you're used to having a high pH on whatever you're sampling. Uh, top right is a NTU standards. We'll go over what NTU is in detail, but uh, NTU is a nephroelectric turbidity unit. And uh, what that unit is is telling you how cloudy the water is. And it's uh, measuring the dispersion of light. So those are standards that tells you exactly what the uh, the concentration is in uh, NTU and you could set your NTU meter by that. Get some uh, scale weights on the bottom and that's going to help you calibrate your Mettler scales or whatever scales you're using the way uh, either your chemicals or way your filter pads. We'll go over that later about uh, what your filter pads are when you're doing a total suspended solids sampling. Uh, vials, you have uh, plastic sample bottles there on the top right of the slide. Then you have another uh, sample bottle uh, on the bottom left and then a sample vial on the bottom right. And that's just to hold your samples uh, and to carry it from one place to the next. If you're carrying a, a sample from the head of the plant to your lab, you're going to use a sample bottle versus just a vial because for the most part you're going to need more sample than a little vial will hold. But if you're now transporting that sample from the sample bottle to your meter, now a vial is appropriate. You're going to use something smaller. So that's uh, the difference in what you're using there. Uh, beakers. They're mainly used for mixing your chemicals or measuring your chemicals. You've got glass beakers and plastic beakers. There's uh, numbers on your beakers that are going to tell you what your milliliters are. It's going to be, uh, or your, if it's in uh, liters or milliliters, it'll tell you right there. But 
the numbers on the side, you're going to look for that meniscus to see exactly if you're at 100 milliliters or if you're actually below. And you're going to hold that beaker up to eye level as opposed to looking down at it. And that's going to give you a better reading. Then you have graduated cylinders. Graduated cylinders are definitely more accurate than, uh, than your beakers. And you'll look for grading on them to get the, the accuracy. A grade A cylinder is a highly accurate uh, graduated cylinder as opposed to a B or a C. So you could trust a uh, grade A's uh, uh, milliliter scale or liter scale uh, more than you would uh, C. And there's commonly used for volumes 5 milliliters or up to 4,000 milliliters. Uh, pipettes, you use these pipettes to deliver just a small amount of sample from one point to the next. And uh, on the top left is one of the newer looking pipettes, but on the bottom right uh, is an older uh, pipette where it was uh, the stem and a bulb and you kind of have to use a uh, pressure in order to pump up the sample you know, from the uh, the beaker into the stem and then there's a release valve, a pressure release valve that will expel the sample <clears throat> excuse me, they'll expel the sample into uh, your vial usually at that point. So you're just transferring a little bit of uh, your sample from the vial from the uh, beaker into a vial. Flask they're uh, used for containing your chemicals and mixing your chemicals and samples. You have a volumetric flask on the less left and an early Meyer flask on your right. Uh, you're, you're just really just mixing at that point. Uh, your burettes, your, class, uh, your glass burettes, they're kind of like your graduated cylinders. You've got uh, different classes and the higher the grade, the more accurate it is. You would fill a burette with, uh, with usually some sort of acid solution uh, where you could drip into that sample, kind of like I described earlier, where drip by drip you're trying to get that acid solution into uh, a beaker or a mixing uh, a stirrer. Uh, a beaker with chemicals and a stirrer in it and it's kind of like stirring around the sample and you're dripping into it so you could do it by uh, that little uh, stop pour on the right side of the glass burette you, you turn it slightly and you'll get a drip but if you go all the way open then you're gonna pour out the sample and what you're doing at the for this type of test is you want to make sure you're measuring how much chemicals you're adding, how much acid you're adding, and the amount of acid it takes for you to get to either your endpoint pH or your uh, your color that you're looking for. Uh, that is going to be how uh, how many milligrams per liter or how uh, uh, how strong that uh, that solution is or that buffer is by how much acid you're going to have to use to counteract it. All right. Skip over to some of your cleaning stuff. You got a, a, a test tube brush on your left and then a test tube on your right. Test tubes, usually very small portion of sample you're putting in there. You're going to mix it uh, with the test tube. Uh, in some cases, there's a test called a centrifuge test where you're putting uh, mixed liquor suspended solids, MLSS, into this. And you're going to put it into a, a centrifuge, which is going to spin around uh, at a certain rotation per minute. And when you, uh, it's usually a 15 minute test where you're spinning at that uh, certain rotation per minute. And at the end of it, you're going to pull out your test tube and you're going to see solid concentration on the bottom and then you'll see some clear water on top because it's it kind of like uh, separated the solid from the liquid by spinning it.
and the test tubes, what you're going to use for that type of test. Some of the accessories you're going to see, stirring rod, rubber stoppers, parafilm. You definitely will need some parafilm uh, film in your lab and that's so you don't have, if you don't have a, a, a cap that is dedicated to a bottle or a, a glass beaker, you take the parafilm film, you put it over it and it'll actually adhere to the glass or even some plastic and then you could stir it uh, by inverting your uh, your beaker or you could just cover it so something doesn't get in it and get in it but the parafilm is, is great to have now we're gonna skip over now we've, we've gone through some definitions we gone over uh, of some of the apparatuses that you're going to be using now this is getting into the plan when you're going to start actually doing your sample we're going to switch into the mindset of the operator who has to go out and do the sample if you're training an operator or if your facility uh, has different shifts and the same person isn't taking a sample every day it would be a great idea to have a daily sampling plan and this sampling plan is going to include several things like your sample location it's going to include uh, what you're going to look for in your sample as far as uh, your your atmosphere, your time of day, you know, specific time of days you're going to say, you know, here are parameters for sampling, what size bottles we're going to use, uh, is it going to be a grab sample we're getting or is it a composite sample we're picking up at midnight every day. It's something that you're, uh, you're going to use to give the operators some sort of guidance for their sampling. So it's a daily sample plan or you could just simply call it a sample plan and the operators will incorporate this in their plant walkthrough. So as they're going through the plant they'll know that uh, or they're even beginning they know I've got to get three bottles that each hold 500 milliliters because I'm going to be taking a certain type of sample. And they'll know exactly where a location is for the sampling because they'll be part of your plan and do it with pictures. You can have an actual picture of the sample location and just put an X by it, put an arrow by it, sample here, make sure your sample vial goes down or your beaker goes down X amount of feet underneath the water. Uh, just be as specific as possible for your sampling plan. And while the operators are reading over this and getting familiar with the sampling plan uh, they'll know which ones need to be taken do I need to have a preservative uh, if it's gonna be uh, a far uh, trip for me uh, so the sample doesn't degrade by time you get it to the lab and uh, in just uh, every step of the way you gotta kind of think it through of what do I need to sample and you're doing it by your permit so per your permit first that's going to determine your sampling plan because they'll tell you how many times you need to sample uh, tell you where to sample uh, and they'll also tell you uh, the, uh, what you should be looking for your, your final results and those are uh, this all spelled out in your uh, plant permit and then you can add special things to that that you just need for your daily operations so you can always keep abreast of what's going on in the system uh, you can find uh, in your uh, California Manual, Volume 2, I've got a specific page here, but uh, it's going to change with additions. So this one, I believe, was the, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you what edition, I, I don't know if I, I wrote it down, but uh, it has a, an outline of what a, a sample plan would be. And that was on my page 408, table 16.4. Uh, internal audits, very beneficial for you for making sure that your sample plans are effective. And an audit is different than this different check. An audit is going to give you some sort of number system where you could go follow the operator one day while they're doing the sampling and you're telling them, okay, today we're going to do an audit. Uh, you do your job as normal and I'm just going to shadow you and then you're filling out your audit sheet and your pre-made audit sheet should have a rating system 1 to 5, 1 to 3, 1 to 10 uh, something that tells you 
okay, the sampler took the sample in a good location and he gets a seven for this uh, one uh, audit item. And as you go through your full audit, then you will get a number system for whatever categories you have. And then you know we're deficient in this category or we need to improve or we excel in this category here. So between uh, doing a, a complete audit and the operator giving you some feedback, you could really fine tune your uh, your sampling plan. Uh, looks like the Florida EPA uh, Department of Environmental Protection has a uh, audit checklist that's on their uh, uh, in their lab index. And I wrote checklist because that one doesn't give you a number system, but I, I like an audit versus a checklist because now you can see how you're graded, you see how you score, and with that it also lets you know specifically what areas you need to get to and how well or not you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> this still goes over uh, some points for daily sampling plans. Uh, I'll read these to you. Typical lab results can be found in the Operation of Wastewater Treatment Plant, Volume 2. That's your Sacramento book. Uh, my page was 16, Table 11.1. Uh, and that one tells you, a, it, it's a nice little uh, overview of if you say you have an advanced waste treatment plant or a biological nutrient removal plant. It'll let you know well this is what your system should be uh, should have and uh, your, your lab results should be. Uh, next on your sampling plan you're determining the test need that you have to perform. Uh, locate and clean all lab equipment and test uh, for your testing parameters and then can all, uh, calib calibrate all the analyzers that you're going to use. This is before you even get out there because if you get out to the field and you're grabbing these samples and then you get back to the lab and you need to calibrate this equipment, that's not going to help you out because now you're uh, stealing away time if it's a time sensitive sample. Have all that stuff ready to go before you even go out to grab your sample in your, uh, in your plant walkthrough. Prepare the lab before you run any kind of tests. Uh, make sure there's no clutter, things aren't dirty. And when you get back to the lab after your walkthrough, then you'll be good to go, ready to go. The samples will be nice and fresh. You'll get good readings from them. Uh, I wrote here to observe conditions and process areas that are uh, when you're sampling. And if there's something out of the ordinary while you're sampling, write that down on your sample sheet or your walkthrough sheet saying, uh, today it was unusually hot or uh, it was a cold day, or I deserve more dust than usual. Maybe your plant's going through some sort of construction. Write that down because that may affect why a sample is not reading normal. Uh, important to be consistent with your sample points. And that was in your standard method book too. SM is standard method. So this one, it's in part 1060. The page may be different whereas the versions change, but the parts will always be the same. So in 1060, you're looking for a sampling plan. And that sampling plan, one of the points is to have a consistent sample point and procedures. And the very important statement on the bottom of this slide here says, the result of any test method can be uh, no better than the sample in which it was performed. The sampler is responsible for collecting a valid and representative sample. So that's all on the sample taker. It's got to have these representative samples and valid. Can't just uh, grab something willy-nilly and put it down to be sampled because you get erroneous results. And if you don't have a backup sample, you're married to that. You're going to be reporting that sample uh, on your daily uh, reading, and that could eventually come out in your monitoring, uh, your monthly discharge report, your MOR, your 
monthly uh, operating report. Uh, your samples, going back to the slides, sample bottles and dippers, anything that you're using to collect the samples got to be clean. Uh, rinse your sample bottles or your vial with the sample source when you're ready to sample. So that means you use a portion of the sample, a aliquot of the sample, to rinse off the bottle. And that's going to, uh, it's pretty much going to acclimate your, uh, your bottle to your sample. And uh, as opposed to you're using DI water, I would use DI water first to clean it up, but then when you're ready to sample, you throw in a little bit of your sample, rinse out that bottle, and now when you put in the sample again, uh, then that's going to actually have taken account for uh, you know, rent, already have rinsed out the DI water, so it's not going to dilute the sample uh, anymore. Uh, sample should be collected upwind and away from the body. So this is something you tell the new guys. When you're grabbing a sample and you're about to pour out that sample, you, the wind is blowing towards you and you've got that sample bottle and you're doing this, then that sample is coming directly into your mouth. But instead, if you turn away downwind or to the side and you pour out that sample, now it's actually going, if the wind were to blow, it's not going to go into your face. It's going to go out to the side of you, so you're protecting yourself in that way. A note, grab your chlorine samples last and then test them first because chlorine dissipates very quickly. When you get to the lab, if you decide to do other samples, your chlorine now is actually dissipating in the bottle and it's going to get weaker and weaker. So you will take a reading when you get around to it and you think your chlorine is very low when actually it was normal if you were to take it at the time you went back to the lab. Uh, the last point says complete all appropriate sampling chain of custody sheets, especially if you're a MELAC certified lab. And that means that if your sample and your custody sheets do not match up, uh, then there's a, a, a gap in between uh, when someone received a sample and the sample was taken. So within that gap period, anything could have happened to that sample. So the chain of custody is the life of that sample from the moment it was sampled. There should be an initial of whoever took that sample, the location of the sample, of the time of the sample, any of the other conditions revolving around the sample. And from that point, you're going to put it in a preservative or you put it in ice or however you get it to the lab. You're going to write that all on the chain of custody sheet. And then uh, at the very end, if you're running the sample, then that's good because you already know where it's been. But if you're handing it off to someone else, then that chain of custody sheet needs to be uh, uh, fully filled out before. And we've got a section in this uh, presentation you'll see about the chain of custody sheets. All right, we're going to go over some nutrients. So nutrients, very important. I already told you guys about the numeric nutrient criteria, which is going to be throughout all the different states. Uh, Florida is the first state that actually had a mandated numeric nutrient criteria. They worked with uh, EPA and some of the stakeholders, and they were able to get that lifted so that now the Florida uh, numeric nutrient criteria is something that they suggested the EPA and EPA ratified. Here is a nitrogen cycle. There's different variations of this cycle. Uh, this picture right here is uh, not my own. I am not too sure. I, I found it on the web, so I'll have to uh, let you know that up front. But if you were to type in nitrogen cycle, this is one of the first ones that, uh, that pop up. So you're, I'm going to use the mouse on this one. Uh, you got some fossil fuel emission. Someone's burning coal or whatever their uh, their function is. It goes into the air, into the atmosphere, and then that gets caught up in clouds with some precipitation. That rain c 
comes back down with that fossil fuel emission uh, and there's lightning fixation meaning that um, lightning has uh, nitrogen uh, particles that it's actually attracted to and uh, that brings nitrogen back to the ground. You also get some nitrogen from organic matter here, some fertilizer, some runoff going into uh, a water stream, uh, some fertilizer seeping down in. Uh, that NO2, NH2, excuse me, uh, organic matter materializes, becomes NH4, which is ammonium. Uh, ammonium then can uh, go into nitrites, into nitrates, and that's by some bacteria will go over that activity of the bacteria. Uh, they strip off the hydrogen and the oxygen bonds with the nitrogen or a nitrate uh, for nitrites and nitrates. So that nitrogen sticks around and gets oxygen bonded to it. And then it goes back around where in denitrification where the oxygen bond now starts getting loose, nitrogen goes up and uh, nitrous oxide also gets released at the same time. So that's your your bond there getting released. Uh, some of the leaching from the fertilizer and the uh, organic matter will end up in lakes and that also will make the lakes, uh, the water quality go down. Here's another version of the same thing. Uh, it included fire and it showed you the acid rain portion of nitrogen coming down uh, from uh, precipitation. And it's got uh, some organic matter. You'll see that from plants and soils and cattle fertilizer. And it moves into your uh, nitrification cycle with the nitrites, nitrates, and then the release of the nitrogen. All right, wastewater, nutrients. It's a substance required to support living plants and organisms. They have to have nutrients in there in order for them to live. The major nutrients are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So that's your, your major nutrients. Nitrogen and phosphorus, however, those are the ones that are targeted in such uh standards as the numeric nutrient criteria because those are very challenging, they're soluble, uh, water soluble, and they tend to recycle. And so just like that nitrogen cycle you saw, phosphorus has its own type cycle and it comes back and once it gets into the waterways it uh, creates a degrading water quality. So a modification process Ammonia first is a pure, strong smelling, odorless gas. And uh, in nature, uh, it's formed by the action of the bacteria. And uh, the bacteria uh, will go over their two uh, basic nitrifiers. And uh, it comes from uh, the action of the bacteria is from uh, the proteins and the urine of decaying animals and plant forming. So that's where you're getting all that activity from, the bacteria thrives on that. And your ammonification uh, is NH3, one nitrogen and three parts of hydrogen, converts into uh, NH4, which is ammonium. It gets another part of uh, hydrogen, and that's where your NH4, and that's where you see your, uh, your, uh, your decaying bacteria that, that is being fed on. Uh, here is a, my version of the basic of the nitrogen nitrification cycle, and it is nitrite, or excuse me, ammonia uh, gets your nitrites, and then as it processes more oxygen, it gets nitrates, and then your nitrates release into nitrogen and that's your cycle it goes all the way around and, you know one keeps going around of course I like this one because uh, it's got my animation to it so I can always show my animation 
Here are what you call your nitrifiers. There's two types of nitrifiers. Again, this is not my picture, but if you were to pull up nitrifiers on, um, on Google, you will see these. And there's two stages of your bacteria. Uh, one is your nitrosomas, and they convert the ammonia and ammonium to nitrite. So that's the, the first stage. And then the second stage is uh, your nitrobacters, and they convert nitrites to nitrates. So you'll see that stained in green. And that's your nitrobacters. Your nitrifiers. Here's some facts about your nitrifiers. Uh, it takes 4.6 pounds of oxygen to convert one pounds of nitrate, or excuse me, ammonium. So that uh, ammonium, uh, that's for every time uh, you get ammonium in your system, then you're uh, you're going to convert uh, your uh, nitrosomas and your nitrobacters it's going to take four uh, for every 4.6 pounds it's going to take one more pound of oxygen to to convert it so uh, and that growth rate depends on uh, it has to have dissolved oxygen above five milligrams per liter uh, pH has to be above six uh, minimum and then your uh, pH is optimum range is 7.5 to 8.5 now for a good performance uh, you're going to need alkalinity for this conversion and that's basically of course your ability for a liquid to buffer out your uh, your your base and it has to have 7.14 pounds of alkalinity in order for you to convert one pound of ammonium uh, to oxidize it into nitrates your temperature has to be good between 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit uh, that's your maximum rate for this nitrification to happen so Florida has a range in the summer where we get really hot and good water temperatures so your nitrification happens almost instantaneously uh, so that's why you have to keep your organism very low uh, during that time period because you can nitrify a lot uh, nitrifiers are organisms that use inorganic material uh, for energy and growth and that should actually say organic material that's a uh, um, it can actually use both but uh, uh, I'll put that in the next uh, level of the slide but uh, nitrifiers can use both uh, inorganic and organic material uh, the carbon source for the cellular growth is taken from substances such as carbon dioxide and uh, bicarbonate and, and alkalinity. The microbial activity involved in nitrification creates a carbonic acid, so the byproduct of nitrification lowers pH. So as you're thinking of all these things, if your plant's having problems, I'm gonna skip back a few slides, and your plant's having some issues, and you can't seem to nitrify, you're gonna to have to find out, should we raise our blowers a little bit more? Because now we don't have enough oxygen to convert uh, the nitrates, uh, excuse me, the ammoniums. And another consideration would be, do I have enough alkalinity to do this job? So let's say the alkalinity drops off all of a sudden and uh, you are stuck in a stage and you can't really nitrify, but then you're gonna to have to do something to either increase the alkalinity or lower the organisms or uh, arrest the activity in some way. So that's one of the uh, considerations if your plant's having some issues. And then on the last side is your acid production now could lower the pH, and once that pH gets that below that optimum range of uh, 6.0, now you have another problem to nitrifying. So all these things kind of go hand in hand in order for you to uh, have a good uh, nitrification uh, cycle. Uh, your ammonium, here's some of the uh, ammonia testing, here's some of the things you should look for. Uh, 
should be conducted from uh, your influent of the plant, so you know what's your incoming ammonia, uh, and then uh, that's where you can get uh, your your conversion from your uh, influent and effluent of whatever, if it's your influent effluent of the plant, and you can tell what your ammonia conversion is, and then you could even do a influent of your air bay and an effluent of your air bay. That's a good area for your um, for taking an ammonia test. But your ammonia uh, in raw wastewater is typically greater than 20 milligrams per liter, but it's less than about 35. So that's in wastewater. That's pretty much what you're you're looking at. Uh, for advanced waste treatment, it's below one. And with your numeric nutrient criteria, it's going to be well below one uh, for any kind of uh, effluent. Uh, this gives you a little example of your ammonia testing. And uh, I'm kind of flipping ahead here because it looks like I'm going to take a quick break and then we're going to go back to the how to do some of the different ammonia tests. So this will be the end of video one and then video two will pick up where we left off right here. So it's a cliffhanger, a big cliffhanger. I'll see you back in video.